hermeneutic systematic theology and he's going to have some big announcements coming soon about the academy um, Bible teacher, conference speaker, he travels. Um, we were talking about him traveling. I think you've traveled more this year than most other years. Is that correct? Just uh, came back from Utah with Matt, uh, witnessing to uh, the Mormons there. He sent me a picture of Brigham Young's uh, grave to go with my other additions, uh, which was uh, nice. Um, Andrew is coming uh, this evening uh, to speak uh, on the topic of what, Andrew? Can we trust the Bible? How many believe we can trust it? Well, if you don't, Andrew is going to show you why you should. All right, so come on up, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Matt, 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 Matt. Where's Matt? See, he's, he, he doesn't want to hear the... He, he knew that striking first meant I get the last licks. Oh. Um, but, uh, you know, as we, as we gather, the, the thing that is important for us to, to look at is that one of the biggest arguments that people make is whether we can trust the Bible. It's one of the biggest arguments that comes up on the streets. It is an issue that if you're out evangelizing, if you go out with us tomorrow night, it will come up. I'm not a prophet. I, I have to say that when I do evangelism, it's not that I'm a prophet. So I will say, someone will say to you, when you quote from the Bible, but that's written by... So you guys heard that too, huh? All right. It's not a prophet that... I'm, it's because it happens every week. <laughs> I get tired, of that, but I'll tell you how I deal with that. But what I want to do is not so much give you an answer for that critic on the street, though I will. What I want to do is encourage your hearts and help you to understand that when we, we lift this up in the ESV, the one that Jesus used, not Paul, um, that <laughs> actually Paul, Jesus used the Holman Christian standard, just saying. No, um, <laughs> but when we, when we hold up the Word of God, we can say, thus says the Lord, that we can trust that this is what God had said. So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful, we're thankful for the many things that you have already taught us about your word. And as we're going to continue this weekend, to look at your word and examine it and dissect it and talk about it and learn from it, we ask, Lord, that... Uh, we would be greatly encouraged to know that you have not left us in this world without an absolute standard. You've given us two things that we can know you better by. One is your self-revealed word, and the other is yourself in the person of the Holy Spirit. That those of us who know you, that you indwell us, and that the Holy Spirit brings to light the meaning of your word and the application thereof. And may you help us in this hour as we talk more about your word, not dig into it as much that you would help us to have a better appreciation for the science of textual criticism, but also to have a better appreciation that we can stand on the Bible, on your word, and know that it's a solid foundation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I got nervous, actually, when Matt started to speak. We, when we planned out these topics, uh, I took 2, Corinth, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and 17 right away uh, as the t one of the topics I want. So when he opened with that, I said, the guy's making sure that he gets my message in before I have a chance. <laughs> Man. So, uh, but he didn't. He, he didn't. He was, he was polite about it. Uh, but as we, we look into the text of Scripture, we want to understand that this is something that God has revealed about himself. There is no way that you and I as human beings could ever know God unless he reveals himself to us. 
I want you to think about this. God is so, I think Matt had said, so wholly other. God is so much outside the realm of our thinking, our ability to think, that if he did not reveal himself to us, we would never be able to comprehend anything about him. He's so far beyond us that, there, that if you were to look just at his creation, as Romans 1 says, we can learn something about the fact that God exists, and we can learn something about his attributes. We can look at design and say, well, he's, he's a designer. We can learn some things about him, but we cannot learn what we can learn in Scripture. Matt already dealt with that already. We're going to deal with that as well tomorrow. And tomorrow what we're going to deal with is two different, uh, well, th three different topics. One is going to be how to interpret the Bible. Justin's going to deal two sessions on that. Going to deal with the fact of, is the, is the Bible sufficient for areas of life and practice? And then Matt is going to talk about the fact that, does it change? Is it something where, where Jesus can say, you heard it said of old, but I say to you, did God's word change? And therefore, is it going to change for us? Can, can suddenly God change everything? Just to give you a, a, a footprint of where things are going. But you see, all of that is based on the fact of, can we trust this? We heard something about the character that this book is the living word. This is an eternal word. It's something that's going to last. It's an absolute. But can we trust it? Because if we do not have the assurance that we can trust this, it's going to cause dilemmas when we look into things like the sufficiency, whether we can, whether it answers the questions for faith and practice. And this area, it's an area called textual criticism. How many people have heard the word textual criticism before? How many people never heard the word textual criticism before? Were you not listening to me? I just said it four times. All right. <clears throat> I just want to make sure you're paying attention. Textual criticism is a science of study where we study ancient texts to see their reliability. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at the reliability of specifically the Bible. Okay? Now, this is a thing where most non-believers think that we cannot trust the Bible because it has been changed. That's the way it's explained. Now, the Bible is not like the Quran. Okay? The Quran is taught to be that it is, there is one copy in Arabic, and it supposedly never changed ever. And the same one we have today is the same one we had in Muhammad's day. Now, I disagree with that. I have a book that covers the topic of Islam. Let me real quick give you why I disagree with that. A couple reasons. One, you can go to Karm. I think the videos are on Karm with you and David Wood. Okay. There's a, a whole series of videos that is available at CARM where they have videos with a gentleman, David Wood, where they go in and they discuss some other, tech, other manuscripts of the Quran that they're finding. That be, becomes a problem because if there's disagreements and they say there's only been one, that's a problem for them. The other thing is that the third caliph, okay, Uthman, had collected all the copies when they were starting to be written down, and he said to burn the abhorrent text. You know what that means? There had to be something to burn. If there was something to burn that were abhorrent, that means there were different copies that were available at the time that he collected them all. He had to have something to burn to give an edict to burn them. So it tells me that he knew there were other copies. Now, in Islam, that's a problem. Is that a problem for you and I? Let's, this is a thing where um, I was teaching for, for uh, my preaching pastor who's here tonight. Uh, when he's out, I get to preach on Hebrews. This week he gave me one of the more difficult passages in Hebrews 11. <laughs> I think he plans his trips when he's not there. Like, well, this will be a different one. Well, <laughs> no, but, but uh, and I, we, brought it, we got into a discussion of, of the fact that there was a textual criticism Okay, there was a different variant, and I'm going to explain these words in moments, but there was a different variant that was in a text that we were discussing. And we had one person who's a newer believer that had a hard time understanding that there could be 
changes or edits or variances in the Bible. Now, if that causes you to feel a little bit agitated, good, then you're going to pay attention because I'm going to help to smooth that out for us and show us why that is not a problem for us. It would be for Islam. It's not for us. Okay? So, the argument that most critics make on the street is when you quote the scriptures, they say that that was written by men. They'll say that men wrote the Bible, and therefore what they're really saying is the Bible can't be trusted. Now, here's the way I like to handle this, uh, especially if I'm open-air preaching, if I have a crowd of people and they're listening. One of the things I like to do with a person is I, I like to ask him, I want him to really make sure I understand what he's saying. I say, are you saying that because the Bible is written by men, it cannot be trusted? And they'll say yes. Now, I want to really make sure that they are really committed to that because I'm about to demolish it. So I want to get them really committed to it. So I'll ask them like a three or four different ways. So you're telling me that if men write something, we cannot trust it? Yes, that's right. So, so we don't trust things written by men. Right. So men write fallible things? Absolutely. Okay. Um, do you believe in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution? And they go, yes. I used to car carry a copy of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution in my preaching bag just for this because it would happen that often. Now it's just too heavy. I should just rip off the cover and just carry that. No. But what I would do is I'd say, really, you believe in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution? Yes, I do. And you trust it? I do. And I'd pull out the book and I'd look at it and go, that's funny. That was written by a man. I thought you don't trust anything written by men. In fact, can you tell me one thing that you have been taught or that you have learned that has not written by men? And then I go silent. And they realize they have a dilemma. The issue is not whether the Bible was written by men. Because they quickly will say to me when it comes to Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, well, he was a trustworthy man. Oh. See, they, it's, it's whether we're going to put trust in that book. Now, I do that because I like to be able to talk on this topic in the open air and help people understand it. And what I do is this. I will say, so you're saying that the question is whether the Bible is trustworthy. I say, okay, how about this? I will explain why it's trustworthy, and then you explain why you think it's not. And then I go into explaining why I think the Bible's trustworthy, and when it gets to their turn, they usually say, well, I never read it. Wait, wait a minute. Are you telling me that you believe it's not trustworthy, but you've never actually done the research? That's not very scientific of you. Actually, that's what many people would call blind religious belief. You draw a conclusion before doing any kind of study or research? It's not a very wise thing to do. You see, they think that they have the science and the intellect on their side. So here's the thing that I do with this, is I want to show us that when we look at the scriptures, there are changes that we have throughout time with all the different manuscripts. Okay. Now, one of the things, is, Daniel Wallace, who's probably one of the experts in this area, quotes, a, it refers to a variant this way. He defines it, a textual variant is simply any difference from a standard text, whether it be printed or a particular manuscript, that involves a spelling word order, a spelling word order, omission, addition, subtraction, or a total rewrite of the text, unquote. So it's basically any time that you have two manuscripts and there's something different, but they're supposed to say the same thing. So you maybe have words in a different order. You have a, a spelling error. That's what I'm most known for. Um, the, it, when, if you get to punctuation, we're going to get to this, but just keep in mind that there was no punctuation in the early scriptures. There, there was no punctuation, even spacing in some of the manuscripts. So when they argue that there's these punctuation errors, you know that's not an issue that was with the original, okay? Uh, but that makes up a majority of them. Why? Because they were added in afterwards. So where do you put the period? Where do you put a comma? That was something that was added in after. That becomes an issue that there, we see differences. Now, I do have to raise one issue for anyone that does in, in this area. Uh, many people, uh, Norman Geisler, who really got it from... Uh, 
um, I'm drawing a blank on his name, uh, is it J.B. Uh, Light? Lightfoot, thank you. He, he defines a textual variant in the way of counting variants this way, and, and he does it in an incorrect way. The way he defines the way we count a variant is that any time that you have, if you have 2,000 manuscripts and you spell a word wrong in one, he would say that that's 2,000 variances. And that's a, not the right way to count it. Now, here's the way you end up counting it. The way you count a variant reading is if you have a phrase that says, Jesus Christ is Lord in one manuscript, in another manuscript it says, Christ Jesus, that's two different readings. Another manuscript it says, the Lord Christ Jesus, that's a third. So there's three different variant readings, but it's really dealing with one verse. Okay, it's one phrase that has three different variances. Do you understand that? So when we count it, this is the reason we do this, because when you count this, there's actually 400,000 variances. Sounds like a big number, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot. In fact, when you consider that there's 138,000 words in the Greek New Testament, all of a sudden you're going, wait a minute. <laughs> you have more variants than you do words in the Bible. Now, men like Bart Ehrman, who are not believers, that try to argue that we can't get back to the Bible, we can't know what the original Bible meant, and things like that, when we look at that, they're going to argue that and make this point to say, look at all these changes. Can't possibly get back to the original meaning. We can't possibly know what the original writers wrote. I disagree. We are going to explain why. One of the things is this. Uh, when you take a look at those passages that have the variances, with the, right, the way to do this, I believe, is to take one base text and then compare every single, all the other manuscripts to that, and take a look at how many actual changes in the individual words or passages or phrases that have different variant reasons, readings. Because what you have is, as I showed, you can have one passage the same passage that can have multiple ways that it's written in different manuscripts, okay? So when you do it this way, when you look at, okay, we take a, now the problem is, well, what base text are you going to use? Well, it really doesn't matter because if you start with one and compare them to all of them, you can end up seeing how many variances, not variant readings, but variances we actually have. Fortunately for us, uh, Hodge and, and Vestad have done this in their Greek New Testament, according to the majority text. They listed that there were six, in their footnotes, they have 600, or 6,577 different variants from one base text. Okay? Now, I've actually went through this uh, past week, actually, uh, as was mentioned, Matt Slick and I were out in Utah, the to, to Mormons, and... Uh, one of the things of discussion one evening, because this is what theologians do, they get done evangelizing for three or four hours to a, a bunch of false uh, religion people, like the LDS, and what do, what do you do? You spend two hours in the car discussing theology in two separate cars, and what happens when you get back? Now those two conversations become one big conversation. We all discuss what, what we were just talking about in two individual cars for two hours, and it becomes these really late theological discussions which I have no problem with, I don't sleep. Um, for those guys that like sleep, I don't understand what's wrong with you people. You can sleep when you're dead. Life is short. Let's, but, all right, so, so we got into a discussion of this, and, and the question was over how many real variances are there. You know, do you base it off the readings, do you not? I actually went through the work of Bruce Metzger and Philip Comfort in their commentaries on this and counted every single passage that had a variant. There was, there was less than 3,000 different passages that have variances. Now that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Good. I want you to think that because I'm going to make that seem really small. But let's take a more conservative number. Let's say, okay, there's, there, out of the words, there was, there's uh, 6,500 words that have these changes. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you listen to a guy like Bart Ehrman, he's going to say, he has a book called Misquoting Jesus, 
I don't recommend reading it. It's the stuff that I end up reading because I do. I like to do original source material. I don't quote people that refer to Bart Ehrman. I actually read the guy. It's the reason I'm losing my hair. My wife would wish I wouldn't because I keep pulling my hair out going, why do these people believe this? So was it that Matt, what is it you called it, uh, spiritual Tourette's? So, so, so Matt and I have this, this problem. And, I, and, and we, we get into these things where like we're driving down the road and you see like it happened today, I saw Jehovah Witnesses and they're walking through a, a, a neighborhood and we're driving. <laughs> And I'm like, I want to stop. I want to pull. I wanted to pull. If it wasn't for the fact that we had to pick Justin up at the at the hotel, I wanted to pull into that neighborhood and start. We got to go correct them. They're telling lies to a bunch of people in my neighborhood. We got to correct that. So, so it, it this is a problem. Well, the thing is, is that I have a problem when we when people quote other people and don't check the quotes and make sure that someone actually said that in the way that they that it was quoted. So I read Bart Ehrman. I read Misquoting Jesus. Here's the thing. Mr. If you're going to write a, a New York Times bestseller, don't you think you're going to put your best arguments first? Doesn't that make sense? I mean, it makes sense if you're going to say and make a statement that we cannot possibly get back to the original meaning of the Bible. Don't you think you should put your best argument forward? I mean, this is a scholarly man. He's got his PhD. So here's his best argument. He has, a, he has a chapter that tries to argue, we cannot get back to the original meaning of the New Testament from when it was written, and here was his proof. There are some manuscripts that refer to Jesus Christ as being a carpenter, and others refer to him as the son of a carpenter. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that just rock your world? I mean, doesn't, I mean, can you think of all those doctrines that are based on Jesus being a carpenter? Oh, wait, no. There aren't any. I mean, could it be both are true? Could it be in a generation where you took on the job that your father did that Jesus not only was a carpenter but also the son of a carpenter? Could, both could be true. But the reality is if that's your argument, remember, he's making the case that we can't get back to the original meaning Okay, is it a big deal if Jesus is a carpenter or just the son of a carpenter? Does that change anything? No, it doesn't matter. There's not a single doctrine that's based on Jesus being a carpenter. And you see, so if he's going to make this case, he should put his best argument forward. His best argument doesn't really affect anything. Okay, and, and so you end up seeing that you'll have people that will make an argument. You can quickly see the liberals because they're going to refer to a document called Q. Anyone hear of Q before? It's a letter in the alphabet. You all heard it before. All right, Q stands for coelum, which means source. Okay, I had this. We're going to go tomorrow night. We're going to go down to the boardwalk here. We're going to be evangelizing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a young man who was familiar with Q. He read Bart Ehrman, and he was challenging me that we can't get to the Bible. We can't because it was all based on Q. And let me tell you what Q is. Q is a fictional document that is believed to have been the first gospel. And the argument goes this way, is that Q was first written. And in Q, Jesus, the historical Jesus, he was just a man. But see, after Q, you had Mark was written. And Mark was based off of Q, and in Mark, he's starting to get to be where he talks a little bit about Jesus being God, but not really. But then Matthew comes in, and he embellishes even more. And Luke. And by the time you get to John, Jesus is now God. That's, this is what Bart Ehrman does in his latest book that he has out. He makes this argument. This is all based on a document called Q. You know what the problem is? We have no historical records of Q. In fact, in, a, in another New York Times bestseller called Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth, written by, a, written by a Raza Aslan, he says this. this is in, I love this because this is in his introduction. His whole book is based on the fact that we don't have Q, and Q is the original gospel. So everything is based on Q. Here's what he says in the introduction. He doesn't realize he destroys his entire book in the introduction, and no one called him out on it. In fact, it's a New York Times, it was a New York Times bestseller. He states, quote, 
although we no longer have any physical copies of this document, we can infer its context by compiling those verses in Matthew and Luke and share in, that share in common but do not appear in Mark, unquote. Wait a minute. If you don't have any physical copies and there's no reference to this, don't we call that a fairy tale? That's exactly what I said to this man that was challenging me on the boardwalk. You see, if you're going to argue Q and you want to say you sci have science on your side, then you need to first pr produce some, any, just one reference to Q or a copy of it that is prior to like 1975. I mean, this is something that came, that was developed because they assume, and you even see it in what he says, they infer it. In other words, they start with the conclusion and then they build this whole theory to, to support it. Here's what I ended up doing with that young man. He says, well, he says to me that, well, you see, there had to be a cue. Why'd there have to be a cue? Because, see, there had to have been one writer, and that writer wrote, and then another writer had to take what the first writer said and take that and use that for his writing, and the next one had to take that for his writing. I said, really? Now, this was, I'm dating myself, because this was in, when Obama was running for the second term. Okay, so this is when this had happened. And so we're sitting there, and, I, and this was right after the Democrat National Convention. And so this was Friday night after that. And I said, you know, let me ask you a question. Did, did Barack Obama speak at the Democrat National Convention last night? And the guy says, yeah. I said, did the New York Times report it? He goes, I guess. At Washington Post? Well, yeah. I said, what about, like, the Boston Times? Well, yeah, how, how about the Wall Street Journal? Did they report it? He says, yeah. I said, where'd they all get it from? You see, there's one place where they all got it from. They were sitting in the convention, right? They all wrote their story, and there's lots of similarities in that stories. There's also lots of differences, because the individual writers are writing from a different perspective, and though there's lots of similarities, because they're all hearing the same thing, they have a different take on it, and they're writing not, not only the things having that's following it. Well, gee, if we can see that in something that just happened yesterday, why can't we assume that that's exactly what happened with Jesus? He has a bunch of disciples. Some of them wrote his Gospels, and some of them had a different take on things. Some of them focused on one account versus another account, just like what happened last night. You see, take them to something that's simpler to understand so that they can see that the things they argue... They're coming from a book from a man who doesn't believe in the Bible and is trying to disprove it. You see, we see this happen every week. We just had an event in every news station is covering it. They all have some similarities and they all have some differences. They didn't get it from a single, well, if they did get it from a single source, those that were eyewitnesses, right? Well, those gospel writers got it from a single source. They were eyewitnesses. So, so what we see here is, let's, let's take a look at some of these variances. Now, I said that there's, this is a big number. There's still, even if you take, if you say that when we look at the words, that there's going to be 6,500, 6,577 different variances in the New Testament. That seems like a lot. So let's break these down for a second. Let me give you a chart. Wrong chart. There we go. If we look at this, what you see here is this bluish color is the, the percentage of these variances that are spelling errors. In other words, a lot of the guys that were doing the copies, they were like me. Okay? Dyslexic, in a rush. Okay? So the thing is this, you, and I want you to understand something. When we look at how the Bible was copied, there's a big difference between Old Testament and New Testament, okay? Old Testament, the, the way that the Jewish scribes would do things is this way. If I was taking the letter, uh, well, let me take a letter, letter, because it has double letters in there. So if I, I want to write the word letter. I'm going to write the L, and I'm going to have this big chart on the wall. I'm going to look for L, and I'm going to put a tick mark next to the letter L. 
I'm going to find where the E is. I'm going to write an E. I'm going to find the E on my chart, tick mark for E. I'm going to put a T. Find T, tick mark T. Another T, tick mark for T. E. So I'm going to do every letter that way. Then I'm going to find the word letter on my big chart, and I'm going to mark that. You know why they did that? When they got done with a copy, they can look at their chart, compare the numbers of every letter and every word, and they would know if they made any changes, variances, or mistakes in the copying process. Okay? Now, if it had three mistakes, it wasn't allowed to be used in a synagogue. Okay, so that would be sold to some wealthy Jewish person, probably a lawyer or a doctor. Um, okay, I'm Jewish. I can make Jewish jokes. Get over it. All right, so you guys are way too serious. So um, the thing, though, is that in, in the New Testament times, very different. You see, in the New Testament, they had an important message. In fact, it was a life-saving message. They did not want to take the painstaking time to copy every letter so slowly and making sure they wanted this message to get out as fast and as far as it could. So you know what they did? They did everything they could to make copies, and they were sloppy. They had people that would just be in a rush, and they try to make copies. They were not as diligent and painstaking as the Jewish scribes. And because of that, in the Greek New Testament, we have more of these things like spelling errors. Now, if I have a spelling error, it's a very easy way to figure out how to tell. Okay? It's you look at the other copies and you figure out, well, gee, that word's spelled wrong. Oh, the other is spelled this way, this one spells it that way. Or you just realize that C-T-A doesn't spell anything. But C-A-T does. Right? A good meal. Um, Matt's a cat lover. I actually, I went to Matt's house once, and it's late at night. I love messing with people late at night because they're, like, tired and I'm still awake. So he picks me up at the airport, midnight, come to the house, and, and he, had, he comes in, and he, his wife's name is Anique. So he, and he's, like, telling Anique, he's like, Anique, I just got some cat food. You know, I put the cat food in the thing because he had, you know, she goes, oh, good, good. I said, oh, yeah. She's, and Anique says, oh, you're not allergic to cats. Said, no, you know, in fact, my wife's from Hong Kong. We have some great recipes for cat. And she goes, oh, that's so, so what? She thought recipes like to make cat food, and then she realized I was saying about making the cat food. <laughs> yeah. He actually has a cat that looks like Hitler, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. As a Jewish person, I wanted to kill this. Um, so here's the thing. You have, take this for example. Remember I said there was, some, there was no punctuation, there was no spacing. So I want you to think in your mind, or if you, if you have trouble with that, write this down. Write these letters, G-O-D-I-S-O-N-W-H-E-R-E. -E. What did I spell? God is now here, or God is nowhere? Which one? It all depends where you put one space. Very different meanings, aren't, it? aren't they? God is now here, or God is nowhere. All depends what you do with one space. When you didn't have spaces in the original text, you put them in. Where did you put it? Well, some people might have put it in one, some put it in the other. That becomes a variant. That's in the 75% category there. Those are things that we can look at the different copies and know what, which ones are right. The second largest, the 19%, is ones that are not meaningful. In other, in other words, that we have a change, we may not be able to get back to what it originally said, but it's not a meaningful, it doesn't affect the meaning in any way. Like, Jesus is a carpenter or the son of a carpenter. You know what I mean? It's like, what, what's the big deal? There's some areas where it could be G the Lord Jesus Christ or Jesus the Lord. Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. That word order, does it change the meaning in any way? No. That's 19% of them. The third category, 5%, are ones where they're viable. Viable means that we can't get back to the original text. So there are times where we can look at these different words and we can get back to the original text. 
In other words, if I misspell a word and I look at all the other manuscripts and all the other manuscripts have that, or, or if they do it this way, if I change the word order, if all, if all the other manuscripts except one say, Lord Jesus Christ, and one, this one says, Lord Christ Jesus, probably this one is the one that's wrong, right? So you switch it. The, so in that, those are ones that we can't get back, but it, again, the meaning may have changed, but if it's, if it's Bob, we, we get back to the original. Now, the only ones we have to be concerned with is 1%. 1% are the ones where we can't get back to the original meaning and the meaning of the text changes. Now, 6,577 words, 1%. You're talking 65 words out of 138,000 words of the New Testament. In other words, that is 0.0476% of the Greek New Testament. So 99.953% we don't even, isn't an issue. It's only 0.047% that's an issue. Where we can't, where the meaning actually changed and we can't get back to the original. That's what we're dealing with. You see, when they use these really big numbers, saying there's 400,000 textual readings, they're taking every different time that word orders are changed, every one of them. And the, the fact is, the, find, the more we find more manuscripts, the more that increases. But you see, we have to understand the fact that when we look at this, we're dealing with a very small number of, of words in the Greek New Testament where we cannot get back to the original and the meanings changed. Because that's what we want to know. Did the words change? Does the, do what, when we say, this is what God says, we want to know that this is what God says, right? So this is the area we want to focus in on. And all of a sudden we realize we don't have much that we have to focus in on. I mean, 65 words is not a whole lot compared to 138,000. So, so when I say this, now there are multiple ways of reading it. And so those 65 words, actually, there's more ways of reading them. That's a little bit larger. Okay, and this is why someone like some will say we well, have 400,000, 1% of that, you still have 4,000. 4,000 different readings, okay? 4,000 4, 4, different ways that you will see Jesus, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, and that's what most of them are in those, those areas when you, when you have things like that in the 400,000. So here's an, another thing I want you to understand because this is the other argument that you're going to come upon. This is a, a game that people play. And if any of you dealt with this issue, you've heard people say this, okay, that the Bible was written like a telephone game. This was the, the way that you're hearing that guy on the, that I said on the boardwalk. He was thinking. He was thinking you had to have one writer who wrote and another writer took that and embellished it and then another one and another one and another one. Okay? The idea is that it's the telephone game. You guys remember the telephone game as a kid? You know, one person speaks into the ear of another, and it goes all the way around the room, and because you give this really long phrase, by the time you get to the end, it sounds nothing like it was in the beginning. And usually it's because someone in the middle purposely did that. <laughs> right? Except for one thing. You know what? The Bible's not like the telephone game, because you know what we have? Written copies. You see, in the telephone game, it's, it's verbal. And the one person doesn't know what the other person heard. When you have a written copy, you know what you do? You can compare it to what the other person wrote. It's not the telephone game. In fact, you know, here's, here's a picture that, uh, that I had done many, many years ago. I'm writing a book, and I, I'm going to put this in my next book. I, and I really did this years ago, and then Matt Slick stole it and put it up on CARM. Um, now, a true story. Matt, you know, we were talking, you know, so Frank was talking about plagiarizing from Carm. Don't feel so bad. Carm plagiarized from, from Bill McKeever on, at a Mormon research ministry when he was writing some articles on Mormonism. He grabbed it from Bill McKeever, the, like one of the experts on Mormon research, and put it on Carm. 
a picture. Bill says it was more, no. Uh, <laughs> so I'm claiming that I actually wrote, wrote this, did this picture first. There's a picture. I'm going to make it now. But this is a son you could see if you go to CARM. And I, I use this because I want to show in here there, what you have, and this may not show up so well in the red here, but what you have is an original copy. But this would have been the original manuscript. What it says here is the only son of God. Okay? You have copies that were made. Now, this is the thing. You see, when they would make copies, what they didn't do is they, I did not take one, I didn't write the original and then give it to Frank here. And Frank sits there and he makes a, makes a copy and then gives it to the guy over there. And the guy makes a copy and gives it to James over there. That's not how it was. The way it would, would have been is I make 10 copies. I give one to Frank. I give one to Guy, I give one to Matt, I give one to Pastor Joel. I give them to several people, and you know what they do? They make 10 copies. You know what ends up happening when we do that? Is you end up learning that, well, Frank's dyslexic, so he misspells a word. And you know what? Because Pastor Joel, he went to India, and he's making copies there. Matt went to Idaho, which is assumed to succeed and be its own state, and... Uh, <laughs> And, and they, they, he's making copies there. When we compare what's going on in Idaho, we compare what's going on in India, we compare what's going on in Georgia, you know what we end up seeing? We see that in Idaho and, and India, all of a sudden, I should have used Pastor Joe, he was actually a missionary to India. So, uh, but when you look at that, what we end up seeing is that we can compare them from ge different geological area, geographical areas and know that when we look at those, this one area all has the spelling error. You see, so what do you do? You realize that someone in that region had a typo. They misspelled something. They made a change. And so when you compare all the others in the other geographical areas, what do you do? You then realize they're all in agreement and one is wrong. It's the one that probably was an error and needs to change. Okay? And so that's what you end up seeing here. You see, it wasn't just one copy, but the second generation had many copies. A third century generation. Then you see here, Matt's pointing out in this one, the word only is missing in this one family of manuscripts. That's what becomes a family. The family becomes a geographical area where you end up seeing something that's a change. And that change becomes an area. It's called a, a textual family. Okay, manuscript family. And so here you end up seeing that that's what ends up happening here. And then maybe in the fourth century, here you have copies. Now all these copies all the way down have the word only. All the copies here have only. But these ones in the middle, all the ones that are copied from that one are missing one word. That's how it happened. It wasn't a telephone game. Okay? And the reason that this becomes helpful is we have all of these other manuscripts at the bottom to compare to. In a telephone game, you can't do that. And so when we compare this, here, here, here's the thing to think about. When we look at this, we end up seeing that some of these variances, they, they don't uh, have much effect. Some of them, though, you have early writers that refer to these variances. In fact, an early, a very early var variant, and it's mentioned by uh, a second century church father, uh, Irenaeus, who, who refers to the fact that in Revelation... The number of man in some manuscripts was referred to as 616, not 666. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think there's any doctrine that's affected by that change. Well, okay, maybe a whole bunch of Left Behind series books. Um, but really, is there any big deal if it was 616 or 666? No. But a second century church father references this and gives a case for 666 being a better reading in these different manuscripts. And that's one of the reasons we hold to that today. Okay? So we end up looking at far more than just the scriptures. We can look at the early church fathers. So we have, just to give you an idea, there's three things that are important when we look at this issue. I gave you the geographical location. The second is going to be the number of manuscripts. Why? Well, you can see in this picture, the more manuscripts I have, the more you have to compare to, right? The better it is to see where these things are, where the changes occurred, to figure out where, which ones are going to be more accurate and which ones are not. The other thing is going to be how close is it to the original writing? 
The closer it is to the original writing, the less chance that something had been a copying error because you can have a copy of a copy. Every time you make a copy, there's a chance of a misspelling word order of something, of, of skipping a line. I don't know if you guys ever had to do that when you had in English class, when you had to write like, when you had to copy long pat. Okay, maybe you never had to get in trouble in school where you had, the teacher would tell you, you know, copy this, these two pages and rewrite them, you know. What would I do? I would actually see the word the here and the word the just underneath it. And I skipped over an entire sentence. You know what? The early people that were copying the Bible, they did the same thing. So there were things like that. Every time there's a copy, there's potential for that, especially when they're in a rush to do it. But here's the thing. We have over 5,700 manuscripts, okay, fragments and things like that. We have 120 Greek manuscripts from within the first 300 years of after Christ. All right? Now, an interesting thing, if you start taking into account the different translations, we have, we have 10,000 Latin manuscripts alone. So when you start comparing all the... In fact, let me tell you this. If you don't have any of the Bible, take all the manuscripts and just look at the quotations from the early church fathers, you can recreate the Bible in all but 17 verses just from the quotations of the early church fathers. You see, when you start taking the Greek manuscripts, you start taking the early church fathers, you start taking all the, the different languages that it was written into. Now, if it's written in other languages, that, that's not exactly the same as the Greek, but it does help us to get to understand what the original might have said. When you start looking at all, we have like 70,000 copies. That's a lot. In fact, let's, let's compare it to some other ancient texts. So here's the New Testament, just the 5,700. Some of those are within 25 years of the writing. That's pretty close, isn't it? We have, we have, some, we have a, a, a fragment that was just discovered that is in the first century, dated in the first century. Why? Because it was found in the tomb of a mummy of someone who died in the first century. So it can't be beyond that because they mummified him in the first century. Ta let's take a look at some others. Look at this, Homer. That's, that's, the next, that's pretty up there for, uh, as far as the number of manuscripts at uh, 643. Really? No one questions the validity of Homer. You ever notice that? You don't see any debates on Homer? And yet, look at the, look at it. And that's 500 years is the closest manuscript. Yeah, anyone ever question whether Julius Caesar was Caesar? I mean, no one ever questions those things. But we got 10 manuscripts, a thousand years after the writing. A thousand years? How do you know that those didn't get edited? I found it really amazing. Do you know that there is a, a Gospel of Mary Magdalene? Any of you heard of that before? It was, it, it was found in France, written in French. Yeah. You know what I found very interesting? I read a whole book on this where, where it not only gave the whole uh, Gospel of Mary Magdalene. This is many of you actually know of the reference to this. How many of you heard of the book Da Vinci Code? Da Vinci Code is based off of this. In, Mary, in this Gospel of Mary Magdalene, supposedly, it refers to Mary being married to Jesus. And that they, they fled after his faked death, and he fled to France. And the kings of France were offspring of Jesus. Now, this is based off of this one document. You know what I find really interesting about this? They, there, there's one copy of it that they found... And when they looked at it, there's more missing than they actually have. So you're building a whole thing on a document where there's more missing. A larger percent of it disintegrated and we don't have it. But that one, oh. I mean, haven't you, have you guys heard about the, the new one where they, the, the gospel of Judas? Right? How Judas really was the good guy. You know? How many manuscripts do they have? I think there's one. There's a rumor that there's two others, but they, I haven't heard that verified. But one, compared to 
5,700? Really? You see, when we look at the actual evidence, I know we're, we're, we're Christians. We talk religion. We don't talk science and facts and evidence, right? Yeah, let's look at the evidence. The evidence is that we have a lot of manuscripts. Because we have so many manuscripts, those, those overwhelming amount of manuscripts help us to know how many areas that there are variances or changes anywhere in the New Testament. Why is this a problem? If the Quran? Well, see, the Quran, they say that it never changed. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible never said. It said in its original writing, there were no errors. In the original. We don't have the original. Well, we may. Who knows? We still have, there, there's still thousands of manuscripts yet to be cataloged. Dan Wallace and his team are, are, being, are very actively trying to do all that. But the reality is, is that we don't have the originals that we know of. But here becomes the thing. We have an overwhelming number of manuscripts, some of them so close to the original date. Is one of the be beautiful things, if you ever look into the Dead Sea Scrolls, why were they so important? Well, you know what? Many people used to argue there was two Isaiahs, an early Isaiah and a later Isaiah. You know why? Isaiah could not possibly have prophesied all of these things about Jesus that detailed. It had to have been someone that said he wrote it as Isaiah and put it in there. There were actually three Daniel, no, three Isaiahs and two Daniels, sorry. Three Isaiahs and two Daniels. Because Daniel, how could he know? How could a guy in Babylon know about the Medes and the Persians and then the Greeks and the Romans? There had to have been a second Daniel. And then we find a copy of Isaiah a thousand years earlier than any other manuscript. And guess what? It's word for word identical. Oops. It's also dated before they claim that the second Isaiah must have lived. Same with the book of Daniel. You see, when we end up looking at the facts, the evidence, what we see is that we have overwhelming amount of evidence to know that we may not have every single word exactly as it was in the original, but here's what we do know. We can rest assured that we do know where those variances occurred. And you know what? There is not a single, not one of these variances anywhere affect a major doctrine of Christianity. Some will say, well, wait a minute, 1 John, 1 John passage that is in some of the earlier manuscripts that talk about the three being one. I never use that any time that I'm trying to prove the Trinity. I don't need it. There's so many other passages that are just as clear that I can go to that don't have textual variances. What about the end of Matthew, or sorry, Mark 16? See, most, most of Mark 16 is probably something that many people think was not in the original, that it's a later edition. Well, gee, I, you know, the, all of that is repeated elsewhere in Scripture except for maybe, maybe the handling of snakes and drinking of poison. And quite frankly, I don't want to play with snakes anyway, and I'm not going to drink any poison, so I'm not trying that one anyway. Okay? So, so the reality is, is that that's not a doctrine of Christianity, maybe in some groups, but where they like to play with snakes, but you see, you find that there's no doctrine that's affected by these changes. That's the main point. When these guys say, well, we can't know what the, old, what the original meaning was, well, we may not know every word, but we do know the major doctrines. And there's not a single doctrine that's affected by any of this. So when it says the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is Lord, he is God, very God, who died on a cross as a man as a payment of sin, that he actually, who knew no sin, actually became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God, we can rest assured that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ came to earth, Jesus Christ became a man, Jesus Christ died on a cross so that he would be the punishment of sin, so that we could be set free. We can rest in that. I don't have to worry about snakes and drinking poison and whether Jesus was a carpenter or not. Not one doctrine was affected. The fact is we can trust in the reliability of Scripture. Now we have a different task. The more difficult task. Now that we know we can trust it, how do we interpret it? 
Well, I'm going to give you two things on that, two resources. One, I'm going to encourage you to go on the back and buy the syllabus on the biblical hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the art and science of interpretation. How to interpret the Bible. You can go on the back table, you can get the syllabus, or you can just watch. We have 20 lessons to teach you how to do that. Or you can just, if you go to your church, in your bag is a little thing on inviting us out to your church, and we'll do a weekend seminar on how to interpret the Bible in your church. So that's one resource. You know what the second resource is? Come to Jersey Fire. Oh, wait, you're already here. Tomorrow, you're going to get two sessions on it. Tomorrow, Justin is, Peters is going to cover two sessions on saying, okay, now that we know we can rely on this text, how do we interpret this text? That's what you're in for tomorrow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can look to your word and know that though there are men who, in their rush to copy your word, they, they did make changes. They did have things where they, they were in a rush and made edits. None of them affect anything that you're trying to teach us. We can rest assured that when we stand on the authority of your word, we can say, thus says the Lord, and know that you have spoken. And know that there is very, very, very little, when we actually look at the words, that we can't get back to the original meaning. That we can't, that where the actual meaning has actually changed. Where, the, that where there's real issues. It's such a small percentage, Lord. And none of them are affecting any of the doctrines you're trying to teach us. Help us to just rest on your word and know that we can trust it, we can rely on it. And when people challenge us with the, tr with the, the reliability or the fact that it was written by men and they said we can't trust it, help us to know. Yes, it, it, you did use men to write it, as we'll talk about tomorrow. You did do that, Lord. And though the, it changed in copies, we know from the multitude of copies that we know where those changes are and we know that nothing that you wanted us to understand has been affected. You did preserve the message of the Bible. And we thank you that we can rely on it and have an absolute standard in this world that we can say we rest on because your word doesn't change. That your word will be preserved through time in its meaning. And that we can know that we say, thus says the Lord, because you have spoken. And all God's children say, Amen.